I'm just going to quickly introduce um, Uncle Mubasha. So um, he is uh, he has been a member of uh, the Islamic Society of Britain since its inception, and before that, the Young Muslims UK. He was a member of the ISB Tabia Committee and a leading member of the Islam Awareness Week for many years. Now um, he is one of the mentors of ISB Campus, and he joins us today from his home in Woking, Surrey. So I'd now like to invite him to take the stage. Thank you, Dina. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm just going to share my uh, slides, uh, which also you can see uh, what is going on, and uh, uh, hopefully that's uh, that's okay. Um, so, Assalamu alaikum, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-Kareem, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqtadra min lisan wa yafqahu qawli. So, uh, today we're continuing with the series entitled Classical to Contemporary, uh, and by, by this is meant uh, the um, analyzing our vision, priorities, culture, language, and also potentially fiqh. Uh, so that it fulfills the purposes of Islam and satisfies the needs of our situation. Uh, it's a long syllabus uh, of, uh, of uh, Dr. Rizwan, uh, but just to make things a little bit uh, uh, you know, spicier, uh, to give us a taste of what may lie ahead, um, he's asked me to look into some, uh, some interesting topics. And I'm sure we'll cover these topics again in depth in future. So this is really just a, a kind of overview, a, a food for thought, if you like. I have far too many slides, so I'm going to have to skip over some, uh, but uh, you know, you can watch the video uh, later and, and pause it if you need to. And I'm gonna have to speak fast because, uh, because time is short. So uh, this talk is in uh, four parts. I will introduce the issue at hand, and then I will um, survey a range of classical opinions, and I'll try and put some historical context into some of, into, uh, within which some of our jurisprudence was developed. And then in part four, I will compare and contrast uh, the, our times with, with the present. So it, in the beginning, uh, I, I will, part one now, I'll be looking at one of the ideas underlying the argument of those who advocate a clash of civilizations between Islam and, and the West. After I introduce the issue at hand, I'm also going to say a few words about how we approach the classical tradition uh, in, in general. So. So um, this, uh, this idea um, of uh, perpetual jihad, the fact that uh, Muslims are at a state of permanent war with, with all non-Muslims, uh, to be honest, I actually thought these, uh, these uh, accusations, which surfaced a lot after um, September 11th, had all uh, effectively disappeared, except amongst you know, diehard Islamophobes. But I came across it again just last year when I was uh, taking part in a course uh, on the Sharia uh, um, uh, just for, for interest, and when one of the non-Muslim participants wanted to know about this, uh, he wanted to know about it just last year, about this open-ended mandate, he said, to wage military jihad against non-Muslims uh, until they convert or submit. So if I was to try and elucidate the main points of this model, it had probably has three elements to it. Uh, the whole world is divided into two spheres, Darul Islam, land of Islam, and, and Darul Harb, land of war. Um, and there's a state of permanent war uh, or jihad between the two uh, until they, they convert or submit. Uh, and the command to fight abrogates all other exhortations to peace in the text. And to be fair, I should add that some of these descriptions mention the idea of, of a treaty, um, but they're only allowed for, for, for 10 years or temporarily. Now, it's not as if these ideas have not been supported uh, with some evidence from, from the classical writings. And if you were to pick up a translation of a classical book of, of uh, CR, uh, the sort of um, the Islamic law of nations, you might find some, some of these concepts in this model. Uh, so if you picked up an Akam al you, you might see it. Um, you might see it from, from here. Um, but uh, as a spoiler alert, uh, I, will, uh, I will show that this model uh, of, the, um, uh, of the Islamophobes, if you like, is a, is a gross mischaracterization of of the classical and an oversimplification of the classical Islamic scholarship. But it does have some basis in the classical model. So the second aim is to understand why uh, and how contemporary scholars have moved away from, from this model. So um, let me just say a few words about uh, our approach to um, uh, 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 classical works. So, to begin with, uh, every action you know, is judged according to 
our, our intentions. And the intention here is not just to try and, and, and reshape the whole of Islam into the modern world. Uh, the, um, uh, although fiqh is grounded in, in realities, um, if the reality of the modern world is unjust in some way, then we need to work towards adjusting the reality and not the other way around. But if the modern world or the reality is in accordance with or has moved towards the basic framework that is Islamic, then that is a different matter. So we take a balanced approach to modernity. It's not all good, it's not all bad. Um, the second thing is we take a balanced approach to our own intellectual tradition between uh, you know, neglect and also blind following. So as you know, the doors of ijtihad have never closed. No one has the right to do so. Uh, and one of the characteristic features of Islamic legislation is that it has both stability and flexibility. Um, uh, some things change and, and, and some things don't change. Um, and so we, we, uh, the, the, um, we uh, reflect upon the famous uh, saying of Imam Malik, uh, who said, who said, every person's speech is either accepted or rejected, except for the one buried here. And he's referring to the Prophet so we have a balanced approach. It's not quite in the middle, though. Um, we say um, it's slightly biased in favor of retaining existing rulings uh, because uh, most people will, uh, will presume existing uh, rulings to have, um, if you like, a presumption of correctness unless there's, there's some change. So I'm going to have to skip some slides here. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you have to know some of the basics about the difference between fiqh and, and sharia. Uh, suffice to say, the texts do not speak for themselves. Uh, the fiqh is the human interpretation application of the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, Sharia is more of a, of, of a theoretical construct, if you like. Therefore, it's possible to have a you know, diversity of views. Um, when it comes to the adaptation of, of fiqh, um, we know that it's not set in stone. It's not unresponsive to the you know, to changing circumstances. And there are avenues for change. Uh, various you know, uh, methods of, of, of adaptation of fiqh. One of them is to look at the, uh, the uh, what's called illa, an analysis of, of cause. Another one is to look at, at customs. Uh, another is to look at maslaha, and there are other, other things as well. Um, regarding uh, the illa, Islamic thought divides rulings into, into two categories generally. Um, what is called immutably fixed or and then there's also rationale based uh, so the ones which are immutably fixed these are uh, not contingent on you know discernible rationales and uh, the, the month of Ramadan is the month of fasting for example but the second aspect uh, and most of the most uh, of the laws are actually rationale based um, uh, these are ones which, which which are accessible to reason. They have tangible purposes, and they are the subject of ongoing legal uh, interpretation to ensure that their application remains consistent. We say the basic premise of the law is al asl at the alil, and the, the scholars uh, are people who must understand the text and the context. They must understand both. God made the law for human beings. Human beings were not made for the law. Uh, and this is why fuqaha are called people of, of understanding. And um, another thing about customs is uh, uh, the Egyptian uh, jurist, uh, um, Maliki jurist, Shahab al al Qarafi, was asked a question on rulings that have been deduced on the basis of customs. And he said, holding on to rulings that have been deduced on the basis of custom, even after this custom has changed, is a violation of the consensus and an open display of, of ignorance. And so uh, in, a, in a very interesting essay, which I'll, I'll refer to at the end, Dr. Sherman Jackson refers to a, a Saudi scholar, um, uh, Adil uh, Puta, who expands on this topic of custom and what are the things that a jurist needs to know. So you can see here a uh, slide, it says, uh, what the jurist needs to know is the meaning of the relevant text had amongst the Arabs at the time of revelation, along with the custom that informed the meaning. The customs prevailing at the time the classical jurists handed down the rulings, the prevailing norms and institutions of society in which the jurist intends to apply his rulings, and the habits, customs, proclivities, and the like of the people whose situation the contemporary jurist needs to address. So this is my, by way of part one, the introduction to uh, what, what we're saying. Um, 
So let me introduce to you the uh, some some basic concepts uh, around uh, this, um, you know, the uh, perpetual jihad model of perpetual jihad. Uh, so firstly, um, we're going to strive to get a balanced understanding of, of jihad, and this is this is really important to begin with because uh, it has an original meaning and maybe it has a, a later technical usage in, in the texts of, of jurisprudence. And this a balanced understanding, neither ignoring the uh, you know, physical or military jihad, but putting it into its place. Um, so, and it's a, it's, a, it's a noble word. And unfortunately, some of the words that we even we use sometimes nowadays in, in common language, people say jihadism, it's a sad corruption of actually a very noble word and a very noble concept. So jihad is broadly of two types. So there is the inner jihad and the outer jihad. Now it's really important to understand that the inner jihad is the greater jihad. It's the struggle to oppose one's ego and, 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 and false desires. Now people often quote this in the hadith, this is a hadith uh, Prophet was reported to have said that after a battle, we have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. People will say, oh, well, this hadith is weak. Yes, that particular hadith has a weak chain, but the meaning of the hadith is sound. And the mainstream Sunni scholarship have accepted the concept that the inner jihad is the greater jihad. Now you can take this in two different ways. You could, you, you could use this idea to deny or, or even belittle the military jihad altogether, but that would be incorrect. The important point is to put it into its perspective. So we can see here, not all jihad is fighting and not all fighting is jihad. The outer jihad has many, has also a wide range of meanings uh, to do with the, the tongue, the hand, the pen, service to others. Uh, the, the Prophet said, and someone whose parents were alive, strive in their service. And as you know, uh, and then within the, within the military jihad, uh, scholars who write uh, CR, which is the classical works of, uh, of, of in this area, um, they would cover lots of topics, uh, not just these two, just in Bello, just at Bello. Just in Bello is the, what we normally talk about in terms of the regulations during war, and just ad bellum is regulations of, of going, of you know, leading towards war. And then within just ad bellum, there are issues to do with defensive war and offensive or preemptive war. So I'll cover these topics uh, in, in, uh, in the talk later on. So the point of this exercise is not to downplay the military jihad and claim there's no such thing, nor is it to elevate it above its rank. So we see in the Quran, uh, the, first, uh, the first ayah revealed in Mecca about jihad, even though there was no fighting allowed uh, in, in Mecca, uh, Allah says in the Quran, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا So strive with them, uh, with the most utmost, uh, utmost striving. And this is, this is the Mecca surah from, um, this ayah is uh, from Surah uh, Al-Quran. So we also see this famous hadith, the greatest jihad is to speak a word of truth in front of a, a, a tyrannical ruler. Um, and whoever strives for his parents is in the path of Allah. Whoever strives for his family is in the path of Allah. Whoever strives for himself to be independent is in the path of Allah. Whoever strives to gain many possessions for himself is in the path of, of shaitan. And shall I not tell you the best of deeds uh, out of all, the, even greater than meeting your enemy, it is the remembrance of Allah Almighty. So uh, we move on now to this next topic, the next major concept that needs to be examined in the light of our classical works. And this is this concept, which is Darul Harb, Darul Islam, Darul Harb. It's not found in the Quran or Sunnah. It is the description of, by Muslim scholars of the state of affairs in the world as they understood it. It's a political uh, or you know, jurisprudential definition uh, developed in that kind of history. It's not a binding classification. So from the very beginning, we already see cracks in this perpetual jihad theory uh, uh, model and an appreciation of the diversity of opinions of classical scholars. There is so much discussion on how much, how such land can be defined. Is it based on the population living in the country? Is it based on the ownership of the land? Is it based on the nature of the government? Is it based on the laws governing the country? Uh, and we, so, uh, you know, if we take some of these definitions to the logical conclusion today, then whole swathes of land where Muslims live in as a minority, but live in security, with freedom of religion could be considered Dar al Islam. Others say no, they're actually Dar al other the lands of justice or Dar al Dawa or something else. Um, another important, uh, important uh, distinction to be made here is uh, alternative descriptions Dar al Kufr and Dar al Harb. Um, 
uh, it, although Harb means war uh, um, in, within the Maliki uh, uh, school, they, use, they limit the use of Darul Harb only to the battlefield and absence of security. Otherwise, something is called is, is called Darul Qur. Um, and another very important, uh, you know, third, if you like, you know, category uh, is uh, Darul or land of uh, Darul so land of treaty or truce. Uh, and unlike the other, unlike the other uh, um, uh, word, this actually has some kind of Quranic. Uh, some some uh, um, Quranic basis to it, uh, you can see. If they keep out of your way and do not fight you and offer you peace, then Allah does not allow you any course against them. This is from uh, Ayah in uh, um, Surah An-Nisa. And uh, treaties are something that can be, for as long as the ruling authority deems is in the interest of the people, Imam Malik said, permissible to conduct a peace treaty with the idolaters for one, two, or three, or without or without any duration. Um, Another one is actually compound lands. This was the view of Ibn Taymiyyah uh, when he was asked in a famous fatwa of the town of Mardin in, in Turkey. Um, okay, uh, we, we mentioned about the different uh, definitions of Dar as well. The third part of the, the third, if you like, leg of the stool uh, of, of this uh, perpetual jihad theory model is based on this concept of abrogation. Now, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to have to assume that you know something about abrogation already as a concept, the fact that a later verse can change or alter a ruling established by a verse revealed earlier, either you know, all of it or part of it. There are many wisdoms in abrogation, and the classic example is the uh, prohibition of alcohol in, 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 in three verses and, and the gradualness and, uh, and change. But there's a lot of difference of opinion about the extent of, of abrogation. Um, um, and the scholars, many scholars, Ibn Jozi and as Sayyuti, only accepted about 20 cases of genuine abrogation in the Quran, um, and none of which actually involved the verses that we're going to, going to, be, going to be talking about. He, 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 in fact, only accepted abrogation if it was su specifically supported by a reference, by the hadith, uh, where, this, where it was said this was abrogated, because there are other ways of dealing with, with differences uh, or, or um, you know, with, with texts. And one of the main conditions for accepting abrogation is if there is no other way to uh, reconcile the text. Um, and, and there are other ways, usually. Usually the text, one of them is specific, another one is more general. And uh, if you want to go into this in more detail, there's a book by Sheikh um, Jasser Holder, a very small book, Critique of the Theory of Abrogation, if you want to have some more information about how, how it works. So how does it work for these uh, for the people advocating uh, perpetual war. Well, um, they went through, they say that jihad went through, went through stages. In Mecca, it was, it, was, it was forbidden to fight for 13 years, and this is, this is, this is admitted uh, by them. But then in Medina, it was, it, it was permitted to fight in self-defense, which is, which is the second stage, which was also admitted. And then it moves on to another stages where it was commanded to fight against aggressors and then commanded to fight by everyone. Um, and how do they do that? Well, they they say well there was a there was a verse which is so called the, the, the sword verse and the, the, the term the verse the sword verse Hayat uh, al Saif is is not from the Quran or the Hadith or the companions. It's appeared later in the classical tradition. Um, obviously, there's some there's some di discussion. They don't they don't agree amongst themselves into what is this sword verse or you know, which one is it. And then there were two or three or maybe four uh, so called candidates. Um, and often this is the first one, the fifth ayah in um, uh, Surah at Tawbah. Um, but uh, immediately, uh, if you read this ayah, there are, if you quote it in isolation, uh, yes, it sounds like it must, it, it abrogates everything, it could abrogate everything from before. But even in context within, within this surah, uh, there are questions about who does it apply to, the surrounding ayahs. And it, it, one of the claims of abrogation is that it abrogates up to 140 other ayahs. But other scholars have said it itself is abrogated by uh, another uh, another ayah about setting prisoners free and or or uh, uh, ransoming them. I'm not going to go into the, the the full details, but even for this ayah, you can see the one before, the one after. It has to kind of almost abrogate the one after and the one before. Um, uh, and in fact, in another one, which is they say uh, they say in. Uh, the first ayah you come across in um, Surah Al-Baqarah, um, the 190, uh, the one, it's four ayahs about jihad, and it says number two abrogates number one, number four abrogates number, it's, it's too, it's, it would be, it's too much, it's an awful lot of abrogation in order to get to where the point of, of, of um, where they're getting. 
And so, uh, just as an example, um, and th this is what I was talking about. This first, this first eye. There are many other eyes that that show that war is conditional, and many scholars have said that these eyes are not abrogated. So this is the first eye you come across. The first one here uh, in, in, in Surah Baqarah, and this ayah, fight in the way of Allah against those who fight you but do not transgress. Surely Allah does not love the transgressors. This is actually the, the summarizes the whole of just war theory in Islam, because if, if just war theory has two parts to it, um, you can transgress in war and you can transgress by going to war. So you don't transgress in the war, and actually it, within the, the schools of uh, Within within the fiqh, uh, the writings about uh, about conduct in war, although they were written by Muslim scholars many many you know, years ago, they they're pretty much in, in parallel to what we have today, in terms of things like the uh, uh, Geneva Convention. And this other the next ayah in Surah Al An Fal, if they incline to peace, then incline to it as well and put your trust in Allah. Uh, verily, uh, He is the hearing and the knowing. Again. Um, this is another. Uh, Ibn Kathir believed this eye was not was not abrogated because the Prophet continued so, so to act upon it as a legal precedent. And this last ayah as well, um, um, is where Allah does not prohibit you uh, from those who do not fight you for your religion, nor expel you from your homes, that you be benevolent to them and generous to them. And Allah loves those who are fair. And this eye is a general ruling, a general rule governing relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. And Al Tabari said this is this is. Uh, uh, this ayah was was not abrogated. Um, so uh, maybe this is something which I'll cover I'll cover uh, um, next week. Naikah um, and uh, ayahs were similar about uh, about freedom of religion. Um, something interestingly here. This is something from Ibn Taymiyyah, who wrote that for the majority of the Salaf, this verse is neither abrogated nor restricted. It is a definitive statement that is general in its meaning that we do not compel anyone to embrace religion. In fact, fighting is only against those who initiate war against us, even if they don't accept Islam, their property and lives uh, are safe. And if these people are not combatants, we do not fight them. No one can narrate that the Prophet ever forced anyone to embrace Islam. There is no benefit in Islam in any such conversion. So we could go with you could go into detail if you want uh, on on all the various all the various ayahs. Uh, um, you don't need to uh, because it's already been done many times. And one one of one of the books you, I could recommend is a book called War and Peace in Islam, published by the Islamic Text Society, and it's a collection of F essays. And one of the essays is is just just that analysis of all these, and uh, it explains that. Uh, all of the verses are either uh, wars explain either the war is defensive or that without it would be greater death and suffering uh, or enjoying mercy uh, and there are other passages that seem to be sanctioning war but actually are um, merely relating stories of previous nations or talking about jihad as merely a struggle or uh, you know, and so on and so forth so those are the three the three uh, the, the, the three legs of the stool of this um, uh, perpetual jihad theory model. Um, <clears throat> so I'll now move on to uh, part three uh, of this presentation. So um, in, this, in this section, I will discuss the historical background uh, mm -hmm. context for an answer to the question of why sc some scholars did promote a, a more aggressive understanding uh, of jihad. Um, but first, we will also look closer at the. We will look a little bit at the legal rationales put put forward for um, war. So, um, summary of the classical opinion so far. So we already talked about this, and I'll summarize this at the end anyway. But there are multiple levels of jihad. There's the non-binary division of the world, excessive use of abrogation. Uh, those are the uh, three elements of, of that model. So, classical Muslim scholars broadly categorized just wars into just two types, and everything else would be legitimate from the Islamic point of view. Wars based on racialism, ambition, exploitation, wars of ostentation. Um, so, the first type is the defensive war, um, and this was a, a very serious uh, affair in, in the sense of. Uh, um, it's a case of all hands on deck. It's a fard ain. It's an individual obligation. Um, 
humanitarian intervention uh, is also perhaps you know, part of that. Uh, there's, a, there's an ayah in the Quran about that, uh, about uh, intervening in the cause of people who are being oppressed. Um, so most scholars put it into the into the kind of defensive um, category. The um, the the other category uh, of offensive or preemptive war was perhaps not quite as as clear cut. There seems to be a few different reasons, which is why you could call it offensive or or um, preemptive. Um, the, the reality of war uh, is that it's not always as clear cut as, as those two categories. There's a spectrum, there's a diversity of views. Uh, and in a way, uh, we could say that, that the uh, theoretical constructs and rulings came after the fact of history. Um, uh, 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 just also go back a little bit, even for um, the, uh, the so-called um, you know, offensive war, uh, Jihad al-Talab, um, there are conditions, uh, most scholars would say, and forced conversion is not permitted based on the eyes we just talked about. It can only be declared by a ruling authority. An invitation to accept terms must be delivered first. It's kind of curious in the sense that you'd think a preemptive attack might not require that, but undertaken once a year. Um, it, so it's, it's a, uh, what they're saying, uh, it was the, the classical text, they usually say, oh, this is something which needs to happen once a year uh, to keep to, to keep the uh, uh, boundaries of, uh, of, of the land um, uh, secure. So although many scholars believed in both types of war, there was a difference between them on the issue of what exactly was the legal cause for war, the uh, um, uh, um, illa we mentioned earlier. Was it the existence of unbelief or was it actually um, aggression? And the majority view uh, most of the Hanafi, Maliki, and most of the Hanbali is that it's the existence of, of aggression. The minority view, as is within the Shafi school, existence of unbelief, and also I think some from Hanbali. Um, the, the majority view is like, well, it, um, because, uh, um, uh, because there are many, many reasons. So what's, there's no compulsion in religion. What's the point of having Ahl al -Zimma? Why did the Prophet also release prisoners of war? Muslims, why, why are the of non-combatants spared in views of war. There are many, many reasons. So uh, you can see here uh, a quote from Ibn Taymiyyah. The Prophet's uh, biography shows that he did not fight whoever made peace with him among the unbelievers. And the books, biography, prophetic traditions, and tafsir, jurisprudence, of history are full of such acts. And this is widely narrated uh, in his biography. Thus the Prophet did not initiate fighting with anyone and had Allah commanded him to fight every disbeliever. He would have initiated fighting with them. And Ibn Rushd, the elder, the grandfather of, of um, the Amaroas, who, so, who was a, who was a Qadi, uh, he said, whenever we are placed beyond the reach of the enemy, the outlying districts of the Muslim lands are secured and the gaps in their fortifications are filled, the obligation to wage jihad falls from the rest, uh, from the rest of the Muslims. So if the majority view is that the presence of aggression is the legal cause for war, well, why was there such a rapid expansion of the Islamic empire? And the answers for most scholars comes down to the, the background historical, historical context. Now, several verses of the Quran give us an indication of this general state of war in seventh century Arabia. Uh, and uh, you know, war in the sense of, in a sense was a kind of normal way of life. Um, it says that, do we not see that we established a safe haven while people all around them were being snatched away? And remember when you were a small marginalized group uh, in the land living in fear that the people would snatch you away. And uh, also from uh, the, the 106th chapter, uh, Surah al Quraysh, Ila fi Quraysh, for the comforting of the Quraysh, the comfort of being able to complete the winter and summer caravans. Let them then worship the Lord of this house uh, who banished their hunger with food and their fear with security. Why were there even um, the concept of um, forbidden months? Uh, th there were four. Um, this particular sequence was, it was pegged to the, 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 annual, the annual pilgrimage, uh, which took place in the 12th month. So the forbidden months were the 11th, 12th, and the 1st, allowed people time to make the pilgrimage. And then the 7th the seventh month was for those wishing to make a, a kind of off-season or uh, lesser pilgrimage. And then uh, we have, we see there's an Arab, a famous Arab proverb, 
uh, at the time of when the Byzantines are not campaigned against, they campaign. Uh, but also, but uh, the, the Prophet also went went against this uh, in in some ways. He said, uh, "This is a, this reported to be a hadith, but uh, not meant to be authentic." But Imam Malik said, uh, "People could uh, was asked about the authenticity of it. Uh, leave the Abyssinians alone as, not, as long as they leave you alone." Um, uh, he said, "People continue to avoid avoid attacking them." So the Quran, if you like, was responding to a pre-existing state of affairs. Um, but um, and uh, but peace was the uh, ultimate aim of any fighting. But the only way of preserving physical integrity uh, was that. So we don't have to look uh, really only at Arabia. It, it was a characterization of the pre-modern world um, in, in in general. So uh, if you so there's a famous debate between Hobbes and um, uh, Rousseau about the natural condition of uh, mankind. So I'll, I'll be oversimplifying here, but uh, so the, the state of nature for Hobbes was uh, like war of every man against every man. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the reasons why um, uh, it says here, gain safety reputation, but that's for the translation of what he actually said. Um, although Hobbes was opposed by you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, with his view of, of the noble savage, both of them were only kind of theorizing, but when anthropologists study early societies, they find that Hobbes was actually generally right. The nature of, of, of human beings was that we find three principal causes of, of war fighting. Uh, one is gain, it says, uh, and which, is, which, which would be a sort of predatory raid. Another is safety, which is a preemptory raid. And the third is reputation, which is a kind of retaliatory raid. Um, Hobbes also got it wrong uh, in, in some ways because we had, you know, we do people do it, cooperate with, uh, with, you know, it's not exactly every person against themselves. We had allies and kin and everything else. Uh, Immanuel Kant wrote something similar. Um, he said, the state of peace among men living side by side is not the natural state. The natural state is, is one of war. Um, I picked up this, uh, this stat from, from the New York Times. Of the past three and a half thousand years, humans have been entirely at peace for just 268 of them for about 8% of recorded history. Uh, another thing that's really important to understand is about empires, which have been the dominant international organization in, in world history. They go back as far as recorded history goes. Much of history is the history of, of empires and imperial politics, imperial practices, imperial cultures have all shaped the, 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 you know, the world and they have similar stages. There's, a, there's the age, there's an age of pioneers, conquests, commerce, uh, affluence, uh, intellect, fo followed by decadence and decline and eventual collapse. And the great empires of the classical age, just before the coming of, of uh, uh, Islam, uh, coming from God prophets or something, were the, the Chinese, the, the Roman, and also the so called Persian, or rather the so Byzantine and the Persian. Um, and Islam was, in, was dropped, if you like, in the middle of that of that age of age of empires. Now, wars in Europe are really interesting because the current international world order is largely come from the from the European experience uh, of, of war, um, and the the number of European wars is actually mind boggling. Um, from nine, for two two conflicts per year uh, in Europe for eleven hundred years, peace was regarded as a brief interval between wars, a kind of almost almost automatic activity. And the motives are usually were the same as, as we mentioned uh, with, with, with Hobbes. Um, um, and uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, the premises of uh, international law were uh, that uh, the, in the absence of any kind of peace, the basic state of international relations, even between independent Christian communities, was, was war. Um, and uh, in, unless exceptions were made, uh, people were allowed to treat foreigners at their absolute, absolute discretion. Uh, this is in contrast to the, the CR, uh, uh, which uh, actually did have a lot of detail on what uh, on on the rights of people entering into uh, entering in, into Muslim land, and they could do trade and, and business and this, that, and the other. Uh, um, you know, a feature of European tolerance was this was this uh, religious intolerance. Um, uh, at one point, there were you know it was a, it was a thirty years war and eighty years war, and. Uh, um, so, so many Muslim scholars forbid Muslims from, from settling in what they were 
Sikh or Dharma Har because they would not be able to practice their faith in security. They couldn't even agree amongst themselves with different versions of Christianity. And the solution essentially was, was to separate amongst themselves. Uh, you know, one king, one law, one faith uh, in, in each, in each uh, particular territory. And then things began to change. Um, we see we see the movement towards peace now. That, um, um, and Hugo took root, otherwise known as, as um, um, Hugo Grotius, uh, the English. Uh, and he's a, he's a Dutch uh, you know, philosopher, and theologian, and diplomat, and uh, humanist. And wrote uh, this, this book or uh, three books uh, on the law of, of war and peace, 1625. Um, and uh, so modern internet modern writers of international law credit this Dutch writer as the father of international law. And it's interesting, uh, it's an Australian historian. Um, uh, uh, style. Uh, he was so impressed. He knew also about uh, 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 Muhammad Shaybani, uh, who was the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, who wrote the first book that we have uh, on uh, Kitab al Siyar al Sahir, on, on Siyar, on the, on the law of nations, if you like. And he was so impressed by Shaybani, he said Shaybani should be called the grossest of the Muslim East. Um, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Mahmoud Ahmad Ghazi. Uh, who um, is a, a scholar uh, from Pakistan who wrote, who translated uh, Muhammad Shaybani. He said, Muhammad Shaybani was 800 years before, uh, you know, Grotius. He said, it's Grotius who deserves to be honored in the middle of the Shaybani of the Christian West. Um, and the, as an aside, if I've got time, there's, there's a lot of discussion about uh, uh, what influences that, that people had around. It wasn't just, it wasn't just uh, Hugo Grotius. There was, um, Francesco de Vittoria, Enrico Gentili, people like that. And uh, there's a paper, I'll reference it at the end by Dr. Mohammed Munir, where uh, there's actually discussion about what kind of influence uh, the CR works had on, on these people. And um, uh, I'll just, as an aside, uh, Justice Mira Mantri, who was a judge at the International Court of Justice in, in the 90s, he, he wrote a paper giving 16 reasons to prove that Hugo Grosch was influenced by, by the CR. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm going uh, on a different topic there. Uh, peace of the peace of Westphalia, another one of those uh, sort of uh, principles uh, established that's crucial to crucial to modern international relations. The um, uh, which sets up the, uh, you know, the, the the principle of the inviolability of borders and, and non-interference in the domestic affairs of sovereign countries. So we have effectively today a kind of the um, uh, Westphalian you know, system or the uh, Westphalian system. There's another interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, essay from Immanuel Kant, which I, I quoted from earlier, uh, was his essay, his, his um, proposed peace program, which he wrote in 1795, um, and uh, obviously, an also seen as the starting point of contemporary you know, liberal thought. And he has these um, he has these preliminary articles and he has some 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 uh, like the uh, uh, foundation on which to build peace. Um, he talks about having every state should be should be be, be um, republican. Um, by that he means democracy because he didn't actually believe in democracy and because he thought it was more rule. Um, but the peace would be between Republican states and the law of nations should be found on, on, on a federation of states and the law of world citizenship should be limited to conditions of universal hospitality. So Emmanuel Kant's writing may be an example of a, a growing anti-war literature. Uh, and other things that happened, many European powers redirected their energies from conquest to commerce, or maybe we can call it colonialism. Wars were essentially becoming less frequent, but more deadly because of the uh, sort of industrialization of, of, of weapons. Anyway, it all went, it all went horribly wrong uh, in the late 18th and 19th centuries um, uh, because of the rise of you know, nationalism. It was the age of nationalism and romantic militarism. I mean, it, people, it's very confusing period of history uh, in terms of the, the influence of different you know, factors. Enlightenment humanism was still there. But also conservatism and nationalism, uh, uh, nationalism and also utopian ideologies uh, were all sort of competing forces. So there's some quotes there from from the the, the, the uh, 19th century about uh, the a kind of romantic notion of war. Um, 
the fact that war enlarges the peace of mind, raises their character. War is life itself. War is the foundation of all the high virtues uh, and, and facilities of man and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are a number of growing trends away from war in Europe before World War I. Um, the Hollandization phenomenon, you see there, is that some countries like Holland and Switzerland and Sweden were quietly beginning to drop out of any drop out of the war system. But also there was a, a, an organized sort of peace movement devoted, devoted to abolishing war. Uh, they were calling war immoral, repulsive, barbaric, uncivilized, even economically futile. Um, the winners of the war were often worse off than if the, they'd not pursued the policy. Uh, for the social, socialist, the war was the capitalist device in which the working class was actually fodder. Um, but World War I essentially put an end to all of the romantic militar militarism in, in, in the mainstream uh, idea in, in, in the West. Um, and it was a, they say it was a very literary war, uh, which is why at school, you know, we study Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. You read about, uh, you, know, all, um, you read about these anti-war, uh, anti-war literature. Uh, and there's that film all quiet on the Western Front because of the, the absolute insanity of, of, of war at the time. Which reminds me of, of a hadith of the Prophet that the, the, one of the signs of the last hour is that hardship, you know, killing will increase, killing will increase. And uh, he said, a time will come upon a people in which the one killing does not know why he is killing and the one killed does not know why he was killed. Um, Anyway, we then move on to World War II. Uh, I mean, in a way, many Europeans, would, many, many people, might, historians might say that uh, with World War II, it, almost a case of no Hitler, no war. Uh, I mean, I'm not a historian, so I, I don't know, but it's almost as if he was the, the last European willing to, to risk, risk major war, even though his own generals, you know, uh, you know warned him away from it. Um, um, but, and then we have leads on to many things, uh, many things before the League of Nations and the United Nations, you know, um, the uh, 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 Kermog and Pact and things like that. Um, so we have the situation now with this, with, 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 we've reached a position um, uh, of the United Nations Charter uh, that all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means. Um, in such a manner that international peace, security, and justice are not endangered. Um, and uh, Article 51, uh, and, and all the Muslim countries, uh, the OIC Charter, the Organization uh, of Islamic Cooperation, uh, um, calls upon all member states to adhere. And, and all Muslim countries have, have actually signed up to it. There's no conflict as far as they're concerned with that. And uh, Christian concepts are so hard. Um, so uh, we've reached what might be called a state of peace. Uh, um, a true state of peace appears to have developed based on genuine mutual confidence that war between them is practically eliminated even as an option. Nothing like this has ever existed in human history. In history. So we're just going to bring this all together um, uh, in the final part um, of this presentation. Um, what, I'm going to revisit the perpetual jihad theory model, uh, discuss the impact of the change to a state of peace in the 20th century, and and then just have a, a, a quick um, some if you like concluding remarks. Um, so we find that the model uh, that actually breaks down com pretty comprehensively in so many ways. Um, the aim is not to prove you know the Orientalist Islamophobes wrong. It's to consider what of the classical tradition is also subject subject to change. So uh, the issue of the, um, uh, the divisions of the world, we already said the classical tradition was, was a, already non-binary. Um, some contemporary scholars, uh, there are different views on their different, different approaches on this. Some still adhere to the, uh, if you like, tripartite model. Um, they say it's useful, for example, on discussions about the fiqh of minorities, um, but it has no bearing whatsoever on matters of war, because the basic principle of relations with others is peace, not hostility. And this is from the Quran. And all non-Muslim countries are considered part of, of the Dar al or the land of, of, of treaty. And as we know from before, these treaties can be indefinite if it is in the interest of the people. 
other scholars that say actually the whole model is no longer effective where you know fundamental rights are protected the whole world is you know dar al dawa or dar al shahada or uh, moving away from uh, concepts of protection towards uh, concepts of you know, contribution um, what is the impact of the change to a state of peace? So, so we've seen in the 20th century, we've introduced major changes to the, to the situation. And this is an unprecedented development in the history of, of the world. Um, and this fundamental difference between the prevailing reality of modern, pre-modern and modern times, it both justifies and requires a different interpretation and application of all scriptural and juridical uh, injunctions that, uh, you know, that command the Muslims to you know, wage war against non-religious. So contrary to the situation, um, there is no obligation under a state of, uh, under, compared to prevailing, compared to state of war, under a state of peace, there's no obligation to wage uh, aggressive jihad. Another way of looking at it is the legal cause has disappeared. The legal cause for fighting was aggression. And the absence of aggression means that fighting cannot be initiated. And it doesn't matter how this situation came about. Um, um, uh, what matters in legal deliberations is the concrete situation on the ground, not the, as you say, the agency uh, with which the situation is brought in, into being. So um, the legal rationales for war can only be can only be um, you know self defence. The third aim of self defence is retained. The third kifaya, the collective obligation of dealing with the threat of war, is by is satisfied by having a standing army and adherence to any any um, you know, treaty obligations. There are some of the grey areas that scholars have discussed. Uh, so humanitarian intervention, which you mentioned uh, earlier on, is uh, is subject to um, it, subject to international treaty obligations and multiple political considerations of harms and benefits and priorities. It is. Uh, in the words of some scholars, this is to do with the fiqh of uh, uh, politics, which is which is very very different uh, from uh, which is not a not a clear cut uh, issue. I have seen some papers where people have said, "Oh, it li leaves open some, some other grey areas," uh, where previously we talked about some of the objectives uh, for war being uh, the the lack of the freedom to, uh, uh, if you like. Um, um, uh, the lack of the freedom of uh, dawah in uh, uh, non-Muslim territories. Actually, this is a bizarre justification for going to war. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't allow me uh, to have to broadcast peace TV in your land or whatever it is, we will go to war. And this kind of, I've seen some of these papers where they talk about ambivalent uh, universalism of, of in the Islamic modern context. I, guess, I think this betrays a lack of understanding, awareness of the overall objectives of Islam and the overall teachings of, of Islam generally. So we go back to this a balanced understanding of jihad. Um, we know that the classical tradition affirms multiple levels of jihad. We know that not all jihad is qital and not all fighting is jihad. Is jihad. Uh, we know that the books, of, uh, the books of fiqh use jihad to mean exclusively military warfare, but Islam is not just fiqh. It is also aqida, akhlaq, it is tazkiyah, it is tasawwuf, it is all of these things. And they, we, we say military jihad is not, uh, is not uh, the goal. It's necessity, it's the necessity of means, not, not of ends. And military jihad is not an individual obligation upon every Muslim on the same level as the obligations. We mentioned before, um, Dr. Rizwan did a talk um, a few weeks ago on, on the core values ayahs. It is not included in the characteristics of the of al Bari Surah Al Baqarah. It is not the characteristics of believers in Surah Al Fal or Surah Al Mu'minun or in Surah Al Rad or in the, the Ibad Al Rahman in Surah Al Furqan or in Surah Al Dariyat or in Surah Al Insan. Okay, and there are far more ayahs emphasizing peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, compassion. If you take the take the overview. You could or you could take the sort of ground level and comparing eyes with eyes and put them side by side. But the overall, the overall view, I, I think this this hadith uh, kind of um, puts the jihad into, into perspective. But the Prophet said, "Do not, O oh people, do not desire to meet the enemy, but rather ask Allah for safety 
if you meet your enemy in battle, be patient and know that paradise is under the shade of swords. Uh, verily after them, there will be conflicts or affairs. So if you are able to end them in peace, then, then do so. You know, so uh, this kind of shows you that uh, there, is, there is nobility in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a just war if you had to fight it. Uh, and uh, a great reward for, for, for the martyrs. And we know that this is all from, from the Hadith. And uh, another thing is that, uh, another overview, if you like, a sort of global view of Islam is that, and which is why people get confused, but they think there'll be some gray areas uh, because we know this, but they may not know it. We know that Islam and peace belong linguistically to the same root. We know that, that Islam promotes the spreading of peace. We know that peace is one of the most beautiful names of Allah. We know in so many hadith the Prophet said, he said, he said, Afshur Salam. He said, Afshur Salam, what imotal ta'am, wasallu nasu niyam, tadkhulun jannah as salam. Oh people, spread peace, feed the hungry, and, and pray at night when people are sleeping. We know that the objectives uh, of uh, Islam, the maqasid of uh, Sharia, of the preservation of life, of mind, of religion, of property. We know that peace is, this, is, this, is the greeting of believers in this world and in the hereafter. We know the Prophet said, do not wish for war. We know the Quran refers to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as, uh, as um, you know, a uh, manifest victory. We know that we, we have to incline to peace if the other side inclines to peace. You know, even the symbols and names of in Islam or, or, or promote peace. The Prophet said the leader is a shield behind which people fight, not, not, not a sword. And we dislike the names like, like Harb uh, to give to people. Uh, so uh, I've, I've only got five minutes uh, for questions. If anybody has any questions, I think we, we, we're going to try and wrap up uh, at nine o'clock. Um, but that's the end of, of, of this presentation. Uh, inshallah. Um, uh, I will just also, just to finish off, uh, just point you towards some articles to read. Uh, I actually got some of the history of the decline of violence in the West from, from, from um, Stephen Pinker's book on the, the better angels of our nature. But um, if you want to just go for, for articles and you haven't got time to read the books, then I recommend, uh, I, I recommend um, uh, you reading these particular articles. Um, no list would be complete without something by Dr. Sherman Jackson. So it's it's very it's an old one, but it's it's one of the best. Um, Jihad in the modern world. Dr. Muhammad Munir has a he's has a survey uh, in 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 this uh, in this essay. Uh, Imam Zaid Shakir uh, did a, a, a article uh, in a book uh, called Jihad is not perpetual warfare. Uh, it's also available in his book called Scattered Pictures. Um, War and Peace in Islam, published by the Islamic Text Society, is a collection of essays which I mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, a Guide to Refuting Jihadism is also available online by Rashid Ali. Ustad uh, Shurkhil um, Sharif uh, has got articles uh, online on jihad, martyrdom, war and peace. And also Ustad um, Justin Parrott uh, from the, the uh, Yaqeen Institute also has just war theory in, in the Quran and, and Sunnah. Uh, on the Yaqeen Institute website. And there are also the, uh, you know, if you like, um, it's called Justin Bello is also, uh, is also uh, articles on that there. If you want to uh, go for, um, you know, um, books, then I mentioned Professor Mahmoud Ahmed Ghazi, who's a Pakistani, who was a, a you know, Pakistani uh, professor. Uh, he translated um, uh, the books uh, of um, Shaybani, which is, which is, I think, the, the, the most famous book on CR and the Kitab of CR and Kabir and Kitab of CR and Safir. Um, I would recommend the Majid Khadouri translation from 1955. It seems, from my understanding, a lot of Orientalists got their understanding from the Majid Khadouri translation, and I think it also has some sort of flaws in it. The Muslim Conduct of State by Dr. Muhammad uh, Hamidullah. I think this book is out of print. Actually, but uh, it's been, been reprinted, uh, republished in 1991, I think. Um, toward uh, an Islamic theory of international relations by uh, Professor Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman. I think it was one of the first Triple IT books uh, that came out in 86 and republished in 93. Um, another important contribution uh, I should mention is, is Fiqh al Jihad in 2009. It was quite famous when it came out by Dr. Yusuf 
on Faradawi. And um, it, uh, it, it, a lot, some of the discussion I mentioned here and reflects uh, what he says. And also, uh, I, I, I was going to say, recommend this book by uh, Professor Juan, uh, uh, Juan Cole uh, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires. Uh, it was a professor at the University of, a professor of history at the University of uh, Michigan. Um, not that I agree with everything in the book, but you know, you need to know your Sira because he puts a lot of these things in, in to, as well, so that you see this overall. Uh, so um, that's the end of, uh, of my talk, uh, inshallah. Uh, um, so I, we just had one question in the Q&A. Um, what is the uh, definition of fiqh? Um, uh, so um, it was, um, so this is the difference between fiqh and sharia. Another talk, but fiqh is actually jurisprudence, if you like. The, 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 in the Quran, it, it, it means, um, it means it's used to mean understanding, if you like. Uh, you know, faham. Uh, do you un do you, do you understand? Uh, but um, we use it now. It's translated in English as um, like jurisprudence, the application of the texts to derive the, the, the sort of detailed laws. Um, um, you mentioned the prophet's uh, example. Uh, um, how many of the customers were preemptive, aggressive, and defensive? Yes, um, I don't have. Uh, um, were there clear justifications? Yes, there were clear justifications. I think you'll have to read some of the some of the literature that I've, I've got. Some of the papers they actually go through um, go through all all the so-called uh, episodes in the Sira where there was. Supposedly preemptive, and even even this book, in, you know, uh, what's it called, Juan Cole. Even that one, he uh, he actually um, discusses the sort of, um, if you like, battles uh, of, um, of of Prophet Sallallahu Okay, I'm going to have to stop. I think I've been told to stop uh, because uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. Subhanahu wa taala. And I will hand back now to uh, Dina and uh, stop sharing these uh, slides of mine. Um, huge, huge thank you, Jazakallah um, to Mubashra Khan for a very interesting and uh, informative talk um, that that was.